Greetings everyone, welcome to this five part video series where we are going to learn how to create and query a database given a business problem and do so in a very robust way through the use of stored procedures, triggers and views. All the videos are linked below in the description as is a SQL script file you can use if you would like to play along at home. If you like this video and would like to see more content like this, well, you're in luck because there is a lot of great relational and non-relational database content all over this channel. So take a moment to take a look around, click like, subscribe, comment, do all the YouTube things, but most of all, have fun learning about databases. This is how we do it. So to give an example of how our ER diagrams work, we have a short vignette here that we're going to read. Bizan Grocers is a grocery store where customers can buy a wide range of products. The first time a customer completes a purchase at BG, they are assigned a customer ID and their first name and last name are recorded in the database. All items at BG are identified by a UPC and have a description, quantity on hand, and price. Customers typically purchase several products on each visit to BG and may purchase several units of the same item. The approach that I like to take is to identify all of our entities and then the relationships between those entities. And typically we think of entities as the things that are the nouns in our story. So the person, place, and things and uh, relationships to be the verbs in the story. So as I'm reading through this, uh, it's a grocery store where customers can buy a wide range of products. And I think those are gonna be the only two entities in this story. And the relationship between these entities is that customers buy products. So we represent our entities with squares. So we have customer and product, and then we have this diamond or this relationship between the entities. A customer buys a product, or we could say a product is bought by a customer. So we have some attributes of customers, their customer ID, their first name, and their last name. And you can see here we've underlined the customer ID to identify that this is our unique identifier for the customer. It's going to be our primary key, okay? We also have some attributes about a product, the universal product code or UPC, description, quantity on hand, and price. And we've uh, chosen UPC here as our unique identifier. We have some additional structural constraints around the participation and cardinality of these entities in our relationship. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is our participation. And in the story, it says the first time a customer completes a purchase at BG, they are assigned a customer ID. So it sounds like we probably couldn't have any customers or no one would be considered a customer before they've completed a purchase. So I'm going to say customer has mandatory participation in this relationship, which we're going to represent by this little line here across the relationship. So a customer buys a minimum of one product. And knowing what I know about grocery stores, I'm gonna say that there is the chance that a product might not ever be purchased, right? And like the, as soon as we, like when we first get a new product, in the house, uh, maybe no one has bought it yet. So we're going to say product has optional participation in this relationship, okay? Uh, reading a little more into the story, uh, customers typically purchase several products on each visit to uh, Bizan Grocers. So the cardinality of customer is going to be many, which we're going to represent by either an M or an N here, just on the other side of the relationship and uh, may purchase several units of the same item. Okay, so that's saying that when we have an individual product, a customer might purchase it multiple times, multiple units of that, which also implies that we could have multiple customers purchase the same item. Uh, so product is also going to have a cardinality of many. Okay, now another thing that would kind of tip us off here that product has a cardinality of many is that we have this attribute called quantity on hand. So kind of the way I'm looking at this is that we have one class of product, like a, a bag of Doritos, and we're gonna say we have 20 of these individual bags of Doritos in our inventory. So Doritos can be purchased multiple times. Now this is different than if we were tracking each individual product, which would be uh, the case if we were looking at something like automobiles that are uniquely identified by their VIN. Right? Cell phones have a unique identifier for each individual cell phone. 
firearms all have a serial number, so you track those individually, but something like a box of cereal or a bag of potato chips, you don't track those individually, you just track them uh, as a class of product, and then we have this quantity on hand. And then looking in just a little bit more depth into this very last statement here, uh, customers may purchase several units of the same item. So it sounds like there might be a quantity of a product that a customer would purchase. Now, is that an attribute of the customer or of the product? Well, neither. That's actually going to be an attribute of our relationship because the quantity of the product being purchased is going to depend on the combination of the customer and the product. Okay, so that's a, an attribute of our relationship. Now, some of you may know that we actually can't create a many-to-many -many relationship in a database. What we have to do is decompose this into two one-to-many relationships and have this special type of relation in the middle called a gerund. Okay, so each instance of this gerund is going to represent a product that a customer has purchased and there will be some quantity of that product. So this, uh, this basically is capturing each line on the receipt when a customer purchases a product, okay? So when we create this gerund, the primary key of the two uh, relations that were in the many-to-many -many relationship that the gerund is decomposing, both go into the gerund and are foreign keys which reference that primary key in the original relation. Okay, so customer ID and UPC are both foreign keys and together make up a composite primary key. Now, some of you may have already noticed the problem that we are going to encounter here, which is that in this current design, a customer could only purchase a product one time, right? So what we actually want to do is probably uh, record something like the date of the purchase so that on multiple days, the customer could come back and purchase the same uh, product or a product with the same UPC. And I, I have to admit, this is really a lot simplified from how we would actually design this database because in reality, instead of capturing the date of purchase as part of the gerund, we would probably have another relation that's like a, a shopping cart or something like that where you record individual transactions. But for the sake of what we're going to be doing in this demo, let's just uh, kind of leave it at this for the time being. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk a little bit about keys. Three types of keys that we often talk about that refer to the uniqueness of tuples within our relation are the super keys, candidate keys, and primary key of the relation. So a super key just has the property of being unique, and we might have lots of those in our relation. A candidate key is just a super key that is irreducible, that we can't make any more simple and it remain unique. And then a primary key is just a candidate key that we have selected uh, to apply the entity integrity constraint to, which means that it cannot be null. So the primary key is what we most often think of as a unique identifier within our relation, but candidate keys and super keys are also unique. When we talk about joining two relations or two tables together, in order to do that, we have to identify a foreign key. So a foreign key is an attribute that refers to an attribute in some other relation in order to establish that relationship between the two relations. Now, importantly, all values of our foreign key must be in the domain of values of the candidate key to which it refers. And normally it's best if our foreign key refers to uh, the primary key, but technically it just has to be any of the candidate keys that we've identified in our relation. So the foreign key is what establishes a relationship between two relations and allows us to do things like our inner join and our outer join. So the inner join is just uh, where we take our two relations and we create a new relation based on uh, a common value of the foreign key and the candidate key to which it refers, and we return all tuples that do have a matching tuple in the other relation, whereas the outer join returns not only all tuples that have a 
uh, matching tuple in the other relation, but also all non-matching tuples in one relation or the other or both, depending on if we do a left, right, or full outer join. So now going back to our ERD, uh, in order to create this in our database, we're going to have to generate some DDL or data definition language code. So in this case, to create our customer table, we're gonna say create table customer, and then we are listing our three attributes and some constraints around those. So our customer ID is gonna be of the data type integer, and we're identifying that as the primary key, which means it is going to be a unique identifier for the relation, and also it cannot have any null values. And then we're defining the other two attributes, fname and lname, to be of the data type variable character of a maximum length of 255. We have a similar situation over here for our product table, and then our line item table, which is the gerund that decomposed that many-to-many uh, relationship is where we see the foreign key magic start to happen. So uh, we have again create table and the name of the table line item. We have all of our attributes listed here. But when we list the customer ID attribute, we say it's a data type integer and it references this customer ID attribute in the customer table. Okay, so this is what is identifying customer ID as a foreign key that refers to this candidate key, and in fact, the primary key of the customer table to establish this relationship between a customer and a lion item on a receipt. And then when we define the UPC attribute, we say it's a data type integer, and it references the UPC attribute in the product table. So that defines this uh, relationship here and defines UPC as a foreign key. Then we have our other two attributes of quantity and purchase date. And then we say uh, the primary key of this line item uh, relation is going to be a composite key made up of customer ID, UPC, and purchase date. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over into Postgres and start executing this DDL code, and then we'll run some queries to see how everything behaves. So here we are in SQL Workbench, which is the SQL client I've used to connect to our Postgres server. And uh, I have a, just a notepad file over here with the DDL code that's, uh, that was just in the presentation. So I'm just going to be copying and pasting uh, some of this code. Again, create table customer. Here are our three attributes, their data types, and then uh, the constraint that customer ID is our primary key. So I'm going to highlight that and click execute and we see uh, the result table customer created and then I am going to do the same thing for our product table and then for our line item table. And now note that we can't create the line item table until we have already created the product table and the customer table because the line item table references both the customer and the product table. So that's one of the referential integrity constraints that if this table is going to be referencing some other table, it has to be referencing a table that exists. So that's just part of how a relational database enforces constraints to keep our data consistent. So with that in place, I am also going to copy and paste uh, some statements here where I'm inserting some data. The basic format here is that we say insert into, then the name of the table, in this case, customer, our list of attributes, customer ID, F name, and L name, the word values, and then the value of customer ID, the value of F name, and the value of L name. And then in order to write this data permanently to the database, at the end of this, I'm going to commit. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight this, going to click the uh, execute button and you see we have 11 statements that were completed. At this point, I can say select asterisk from customer. And when I run this, I get a result showing all of the values for these attributes. Okay, so when we created the table, it created a schema for this customer relation and then the insert statement inserted data that fit that schema. We were to say select asterisk from product at this point, 
we get back just the schema, but no data because we haven't inserted any data yet. So let's remedy that. We'll go ahead and insert into our product some UPCs, descriptions, quantity on hand, and prices. Okay, so now we select asterisk from product. We see the products that we just uh, inserted here. And then finally, in order to represent customers purchasing some products, I'm going to insert into line item a customer ID, a UPC, the date which they're purchasing, and then the quantity of that product that they are purchasing. Okay, so I'm going to highlight this and click execute. Wait just a moment. Okay, and now we have uh, committed this data to our database. So we have customers, we have products, and we also have customers having purchased products. All right, so that's how you can take a story, create an entity relationship diagram to capture the business requirements, and then write data definition language code to create a functional database. In the next video, we're going to be writing some SQL code to execute basic create, read, update, and delete operations. We'll see you there.